jump right into our next invited speaker. Um, so once again, I'll be happy to provide the introduction. Uh, so we have Alice Marwick with, with us today. Um, she's an assistant professor in the Department of Communication at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and a faculty advisor to the Media Manipulation Initiative at the Data and Society Research Institute. She researches the social, political, and cultural implications of popular social media technologies. In 2017, she co-authored Media Manipulation and Disinformation Online, a flagship report examining far-right online subcultures and their use of social media to spread misinformation, for which she was named one of 2017's Global Thinkers by Foreign Policy Magazine and featured in the New York Times, New Yorker, The Guardian, Today Show, NPR, and CNN, among other venues. She's also the author of Status Update, Celebrity, Publicity, and Branding in the, in the Social Media Age, Yale 2013, which draws from ethnographic fieldwork in the San Francisco tech scene to examine how people seek social status through attention and visibility online, and co-editor of the Sage Handbook of Social Media, Sage 2017. Her, her current book project examines how the network nature of online privacy disproportionately impacts marginalized individuals in terms of gender, race, and socioeconomic status. Margaret was formerly director of the McGannon Communication Research Center and assistant professor of communication and media studies at Fordham University and a postdoctoral researcher in the Social Media Collective at Microsoft Research New England. Her most recent article on the ethics of celebrity new photo leaks appears in Ethics and Information Technology. So let's give Alice a warm welcome. Hi. That sounded much less conceited and less long when I, uh, when I emailed it uh, to Kurt. Um, well, thank you all for inviting me here. It's great to be here. I've really enjoyed talking to an audience, listening to everybody else's um, thoughts on these topics. Um, so I'm an ethnographer, a qualitative social scientist who studies social media. And I began looking at media manipulation and so-called fake news um, in about the summer of 2016, in the sort of months running up to the 2016 election. And uh, my research team at Data and Society, the Media Manipulation Initiative, is a bunch of qualitative researchers looking at these issues. And we've, uh, we've authored a series of reports of which the Media Manipulation and Disinformation Online was the first one which I wrote. And um, I'm presenting today, I'm very happy to be presenting some new work. Um, and this is a little bit half-baked, um, but I think that there's a lot of provocations in this talk that should be helpful for those of you who are thinking about sort of design solutions and sort of other interventions into these spaces. So when we think about fake news, we're really using a shortcut for a lot of different things. And so I wanted to start by kind of getting us on the same page by what I mean about fake news. And it generally represents something bigger, the information, the spread of false information on social media. But the problem is that we're not always referring to the same thing when we talk about fake news. Um, instead, we're talking about a lot of different things. So for the last few years, BuzzFeed has been tracking the spread of fake news on Facebook. So every year, they kind of put together this hit list of the most popular fake news stories on Facebook. Uh, Craig Silverman at BuzzFeed has been instrumental in this. And if you look at these, you'll see that they look, they quote unquote, look like news stories. They sort of emulate the convention of news stories. They're also extremely sensational. They're often crass, grotesque, sexual, or outrageous. And most of them are not generally political or related to ideology. So, i.e., you know, elderly woman accused of training her 65 cats to steal from neighbors. You know, I think you'd have to be a pretty intense uh, cultural studies scholar to see a political, uh, sort of political undertone to that. Um, and I think that believing and, sh and in general, these things are created just to make money. Like, that's the only reason that they exist. And I think that believing and sharing this information may have, is a problem, but I'm personally much more interested with the, with information that has political or civic ramifications. So stories about crime, politics, international affairs, politicians, and I'm concerned mostly with deliberately incorrect information, so disinformation that is spread deliberately to further ideological or political agendas. So when I use the term, why do people share fake news, I'm a little bit doing it ironically, but sort of as a shorthand for all of these things like hoaxes, rumors, conspiracy theories, and disinformation. Um, and so this is a type of fake news that my team tracks. So those, some of you may be familiar with the Seth Rich hoax. Uh, so uh, Seth Rich was a young Democratic staffer who was shot on the streets of DC, the murder still unsolved. And the conspiracy theory behind his death is that he was murdered by Hillary Clinton because he was about to leak her emails to WikiLeaks. And this first started circulating on sites. This is a screen grab from 
uh, from 8chan. 8chan is an anonymous image board from which many of today's conspiracy theories uh, sort of develop. And this is from Reddit, and it's one of their, actually this also might be from 4chan with the Pepe in it. Um, but it's one of their sort of little images of, you know, they're kind of like carry from Homeland murder boards where they connect everything with like Microsoft Paint arrows. Um, and this, these conspiracy theories were circulating for a while, and then a local Fox News affiliate in D.C. found a private investigator who claimed that he had evidence about this. They put him on TV. Sean Hannity picked it up. Hannity wailed on it for like a full week. Um, it was covered by Breitbart, and then the mainstream media covered it to sort of disclaim it. And we see this over and over again, this particular movement. Um, so... Last week, I presented some of this work at Georgetown, and right before I got on the plane, I started collecting all this stuff from uh, 8chan and 4chan because there were so many conspiracy theories around the Parkland, uh, the Parkland shooting. And there's this conspiracy that David Hogg is a so-called crisis actor, that he's hired by the quote-unquote deep state to add, act in a false flag operation. Like, this whole thing should be in air quotes. Um, and all of this terminology is taken from like deep conspiracy theory spaces. Like the idea of crisis actors appeared after Sandy Hook, that there are actually people who are hired to stand in for the victims of violence in some sort of new world order conspiracy to take our guns away. And so how do these kinds of conspiracy theories and politically and ideologically motivated disinformation spread through social media into mainstream media? And so these are threads from 4chan's and 8chan's poll board. So here's one. And here's another. Um, and these are people working together, crowdsourcing information in the ways that many of the faculty lightning talks talked about to try to put together a, a sort of theory of David Hogg as an actor and proving that the Parkland shooting is some sort of hoax. Now, these are fringe forums, right? The people who gather on these are not, by no means representative of the average internet user. What ends up happening is that the evidence that's gathered in these spaces goes to mainstream social media, which, where it's shared much more widely. So this, is the, this was a number one trending video on YouTube last week um, before it was taken down, that it was, a, it, was, it was based on something that 4chan and 8chan dug up, basically that the same kid had also been in California seven months previously, and had also given, had given an interview to a different news team about a different issue. So apparently, according to 4chan, 8chan, traveling from one side of the country to the other in seven months is like a feat that cannot possibly be, you know, be done by any, <laughs> any teenager. Um, but there are still plenty more, and, and YouTube, to its credit, did take down this video, but even the next day after they had already put out all these, these uh, press releases about it, they still had multiple other videos up. These, out of these five videos, two of them are conspiracy theory videos. And there's still a bunch of David Hogg conspiracy theory videos on YouTube um, that are accruing views as we speak. Um, and then somebody takes these videos and they summarize it in basically one frame. And that goes to Facebook where you can see that it got hundred and uh, like over 100,000 shares before, it, um, before this screenshot was taken. And then on Twitter, you have multiple other sort of conspiracy theories that are, again, shoring up like, quote unquote, evidence from different places that has been gathered by crowdsourcing around the web. So and this is after the social media companies said that they were acting on removing this type of information from Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. This is the, the kind of the good job that they do. So the thesis of my basic, the basic thesis of my previous report is that subcultural groups, mostly far-right extremist groups, use social media to push problematic information into both mainstream media coverage and viral social media spread. And they take advantage of the fact that journalists often source information from social media, and they take advantage of various vulnerabilities in the mainstream media that allow this to be possible. Um, and then this is mostly effective because social media has changed the flow of information, that people are now sharing news from person to person, and also that as I said, social media has become a primary place where journalists find ideas for news stories and corroborate things and do fact checking and such. And this is all, you know, if you feel like reading a 100 page report on media manipulation and disinformation online, there's a free PDF that you can curl up with over a cup of coffee or a glass of wine tonight. Um, and once this coverage makes it to the mainstream media, it's much more difficult to fact check it or suppress it. Um, and there's a variety of reasons for that, which I'll go into later in this talk. So, this is the sort of chain version of media manipulation that we had identified in the report based on about a year's worth of qualitative data analysis. Um, that you start in these spaces that are designated for extremist organizing. And some of them are 8chan and 4chan. Some of them are technologies known as alt tech, like Gab AI, Vote. Um, and these are, tech, these are technologies that are set up by the alt-right, people who self-identify as the alt-right, 
um, because they've been kicked off other technologies. So they get kicked off Patreon, they create a Patreon clone called Hatreon. They got, they, literally it's called Hatreon. <laughs> they get kicked off of GoFundMe, um, they create a clone of that. Uh, they get kicked off Twitter, they create Gab AI, which is sort of a Twitter hybrid. Vote is a Reddit clone. They also spend a lot of time on Discord, which is a gaming chat server, uh, kind of like IRC or Slack. And Discord just this week started doing a major purge of a lot of these far right extremist groups. But, but Discord is a great organizing tool and it's been taken up like enthusiastically by people of all political orientations, including unfortunately white supremacists. And then they have their own blogs and podcast networks. And in a lot of these far right online, online spaces, what's going on is that people are working together to try to come up, not only to work on conspiracy theories and spread them, but also to try to come up with messaging that they think will appeal to a variety of different groups because they're trying to promote their ideas ideologically. Like they're ideologically motivated to push out this information. And they often then spread it to places like Twitter, Reddit, Facebook groups, or YouTube. Um, and this is where ideas surface that then make it into more sort of mainstream groups. Um, then we jump to the hyperpartisan far right press. This term was coined by the uh, the team at the the Shorenstein team at Harvard. Um, uh, Yochai Venkler wrote this, co-authored this piece for the Columbia Journalism Review that sort of summarizes their huge study on hyperpartisan news coverage. But it basically shows that in the run up to the 2016 election, people on the right were far more likely to share news stories from this sort of network of hyperpartisan sites like the Daily Caller, Gateway Pundit, Breitbart, and even Infowars, whereas people on the left were more likely to share mainstream media sources like the Washington Post, the New York Times, um, and MSNBC. So often the hyperpartisan far-right press, some of them will publish things that are outright false. Some of them, like Breitbart, walk a very fine line between ideologically slanted coverage or coverage that leaves out certain things. Um, but they generally present information in what I would consider to be a fundamentally misleading way. And they often pull these conspiracy theories and fra news frames and agendas from these far right sites. And from there, it often uh, propagates to mainstream media, including newspapers, online news sites, and cable news. And that's most frequently through Fox News. Now, this is a, uh, a picture that I picked up in one of my endless trolls through far right Twitter. Uh, this is a screen, this is a picture of contains a list of Fox News employees who are either Jewish or married to a Jew. And then they have like a footnote up by uh, Rupert Murdoch that calls him a, like a Christian Zionist, whatever that is. Um, and the paste bin link at the bottom takes you to a page where each of these claims is fact checked with a URL. Like each one is linked to like a wedding announcement or a biography or like an alumni page from a university that in some way states a person is Jewish or married, or married to a Jewish person. And there are identical things like this for MSNBC and CNN. Now, if you know nothing about anything and you look at this, you might be like, oh, that's maybe accurate information. It's, you know, it's, you know, I guess someone might want to know the religious affiliations of employees. But the problem is that when you contextualize this within the far right, um, the obvious implication is reinforcement for this long-term far right conspiracy theory that Jews control the quote unquote globalist media. And that is not stated in the picture. There's nothing in the picture that states this conspiracy theory. Um, the actual information in the picture may be accurate, although I have not fact checked it. But this image is very easily shared. It could be shared on Twitter, Facebook groups with no problem, but it would not be detected by any algorithms that are attempting to identify quote unquote fake news that rely on either base level URLs, um, keyword detection, or like any kind of false statement whatsoever. And this picture is an example of the types of manipulative media that we tracked in our report. And our work has several implications, but what I'm gonna be presenting today is new work from this project. The first is that fake news is not always fake, and it is not always news. And this makes any solution set that focuses on the fake news paradigm really problematic. Second, the fake news paradigm assumes a very simplistic model of media effects that does not take into account why people share political information online. And the most frequently proposed solutions to fake news are media literacy and fact checking. I've been to like 10 disinformation conferences this year presenting this stuff and I've heard media literacy and fact checking dozens of times. Those may solve some problems, but I don't think they're going to solve a lot of problems and they're not the best fit for the current information environment because of the very social and contextual reasons why people share fake news. When we look at the overall landscape of false information online, determining any kind of intent or why people share information is really difficult because information does circulate in so many strange spaces. 
Um, but we know that people may share false information for income, right? Clickbait, they're just trying to make money. Um, and Craig, again, Craig Silverman at BuzzFeed has done a great job documenting how in before the 2016 election, a lot of the people who are now running fake news sites were running sites that were, they, they would run like two or three different sites. And one would be pro-Trump, one would be pro-Bernie pro Sanders, and one would be pro-Hillary. And they found that the pro-Trump ones were the only ones who made any money. And so you have this sort of shift to problematic information on the far right. Um, and pe people like Milo Yiannopoulos, this gentleman with the bleached hair and the American flag, who's a sort of alt-right celebrity, is just looking for attention and visibility. Like he's just looking to promote false information to boost his public persona and make money. Um, and then you have people like Donald Trump who are using the term fake news to criticize media that, they're, that are critical of them or to call into question the credibility of, any, of a particular media outlet based on that media outlet's coverage. So the term fake news is basically being used as an epithet to you know, encompass a wide variety of information. Um, and because it's so difficult for us to determine intent, I don't think that trying to distinguish between misinformation and disinformation is really that productive, frankly. So the missing piece in this, I think we have a pretty good understanding at this point with all the research that's being done in various areas as to why people create and disseminate problematic information. Whether it's created by far-right extremists or conspiracy theorists or trolls or even foreign actors, we can document and map where it comes from, where it spreads, and how the technical affordances of platforms make this possible. So like, for example, the Oxford Internet Institute's Computational Propaganda Project has done a great job of looking at how bots spread problematic information online. Um, there's, there's lots of other good empirical work that looks at how this sort of information moves around um, the online media sphere. But I think the missing piece is why do people share this information? Like what motivates someone to share a piece of information that is counterfactual and often seems a little preposterous on their Facebook page or their Twitter newsfeed? And there's a very few scholarly or empirical theories about this as pertains to fake news. But when you read popular work on fake news, the underlying assumption seems to be that people sh share fake news because they are duped and they are trying to inform others of incorrect facts. And because of the political orientations of a lot of journalists and academics, I think the underlying undercurrent here is that the reason Trump won the election was because people believed these false conspiracy theories about Hillary Clinton, and therefore they voted for Trump. So the implication is they would not have voted for Trump if they hadn't read this stuff online, which I think is at best a simplistic model and at worst extremely condescending to the people who did vote for Donald Trump. So this is really similar to a model of media effects that was popular in like the 1920s and 1940s in the United States called what we now call the magic bullet theory, where a media creator places a message in the media, the audience consumes the media, and then the audience internalizes the message. So it's like shot at you, boom, you believe whatever is told to you. And this theory comes out of a lot of anxiety around um, in the 1940s and 1950s, it comes out of a lot of anxiety around Nazi propaganda, um, about potential communist propaganda, and also concerns about the rise of um, public relations and advertising and the new sort of consumerist society in the US. So in that sense, like, it sort of makes sense, but it's been proven empirically false like hundreds of times by a wide variety of studies and just like logical common sense. Now, if this theory is correct, then fact-checking and media literacy should totally sh change the problem of fake news. Like, as soon as you read somewhere that the thing you shared is incorrect, you won't believe it anymore. But unfortunately, that's not really the case. Now, a second set of theories around fake news I would categorize as the limited effects theory of fake news. Um, and this is a bunch of recent studies by colleagues who, in many cases, I like know and very much respect. But I think that when, and I don't necessarily think that the authors of these studies are using them, are intend, intended for them to be used in this way, but I think as a group, they're often put together to say that fake news is not a problem. So the first one is the set of studies on the filter bubble by saying that there is no filter bubble because people are friends with people of different political orientations on Facebook and because internet users who are most interested in politics do tend to fact check and investigate different opinions. The second set is a, a more recent study, well, they're all recent studies, on how much the average US adult saw fake news stories before the 2016 election, specifically on Facebook. And this study is specifically using a URL-based approach. Like, if it came from this URL, it's fake news. If it didn't, it's not. 
Um, and the in, it said that the average U.S. adult saw maybe one or two fake news stories before the 2016 election. And then the last study was trying to look at whether the internet contributes to polarization. Um, they found that the most polarized group of adults in the US are over 65, which is also the group least likely to use the internet, um, although they are a group that watches a lot of cable news, I might add. Um, and therefore, they found a limited connection between the internet and political polarization. I think all these studies have some validity, but I do think that they do tend to operationalize fake news in a very limited manner that leaves out things like YouTube videos and memes and pictures and other things that spread problematic information. I also think that they generally ignore the relationship between the mainstream media and problematic information. They assume that all problematic information is spread online and that the mainstream media does not spread problematic information, which I do not think is true. And finally, I think that when you're trying to draw causal relationships between viewing fake news and a particular outcome, that's really hard to do. So what I am proposing is what I'm calling a socio-technical model of media effects. I'm taking the term socio-technical from science and technology studies to sort of think about the interactions between technology and humans. That when you're trying to assess the effects of a particular type of media, you need to take into account actors, patterns, and affordances. So actors, drawing from active audience theory, from cultural studies, that people make meaning from media based on their social position, their identity, their discursive resources, and their skill set. So what do they have av available to them to make sense of media? That media has patterns, that media messages are structured to fulfill a particular agenda, whether that's you know, an advertisement whose function is to increase consumption, whether it's a YouTube video that's just trying to get you to spend more time on the website, or whether it's a political ad that's trying to get you to, that's trying to change your mind or further a political agenda, media messages are structured with particular goals. And finally, the affordances, that the material settings of media consumption, whether that's a newspaper or a cable news story or social media, affect both meaning making and messaging. And so I'm using this, this idea of fake news to try to understand this. Now, this is kind of great because I'm also thinking about signaling theory, although um, I'm not citing Judith Dom's work specifically, but I am, I have been. So anyway, so I started thinking about like, what's the best way to try to understand what, how fake news, like why do people share fake news? And so I decided that I was gonna start by focusing on the conservative media sphere, since there's a fair number of studies that say that the conservative media sphere is more likely to include false or misleading information um, than the mainstream media. I think that there's a really fruitful opportunity to do, to do work on more left-wing media spheres by thinking about health information and vaccinations and all those kind of like woo-woo things about crystals that I see floating around my Facebook feed. Um, so I'm hoping to do some work in that area. But for today, I'm just gonna be focusing on the research I've been doing on the conservative media sphere. Um, and a lot of this kind of shows that are right internet users are more likely to share problematic information that there's and there's a variety of reasons for that which I'll also talk about now I've been reading this book by Reese Peck who's a sociologist at CUNY and it's not out yet but he talks about how the mainstream media regardless of what it's covering tends to present itself with the sort of liberal urban or elite identity so they'll cover an album by Kendrick Lamar or they'll talk about how to be a great frequent flyer or they'll sort of assume that everybody lives in New York or LA or San Francisco or maybe Chicago um, and whereas Fox News tends to appeal to a more conservative rural or everyman identity and so people tend to sort of affiliate themselves with media not necessarily based on the content of the media but on the identity that the media projects and there's a number of studies in political science that find that when you're talking about affiliation with a uh, a partisan side that you tend to pick a party based on other people who are like you and what they believe so rather than deciding what your beliefs are and then picking a party people often kind of pick a party and then sort of I wouldn't say change their beliefs but sort of allow their beliefs to feel let them feel accepted within a particular party so by examining conservative media I think we are able to understand better why people share the sort of fake news that is rightward leaning so I ended up reading a whole bunch of books on Fox News and conservative and partisan media, Rush Limbaugh, talk shows, all that. Um, and they are really revealing on the types of information that is contained in conservative media over and over again. Um, so the first theme is that conservative values are under attack from liberals. And on social media, you often see this as being as sort of being uh, the stand-ins for this are often immigrants, trans people, feminists, Black Lives Matter activists, Antifa, or whatever the boogeyman of the moment is. 
Um, the second theme is that the mainstream media are left-wing elites who wish to destroy traditional values and are corrupt and greedy, um, and also look down upon conservatives, I might add. And finally, that the, the, the conservative media tends to reflect a cultural identity of blue-collar whiteness and reject a liberal urban identity. All right, so I'm going to skip to the next slide because I put information on both slides, which I don't need to. So I also want to think about the affect of conservative news. And by affect, I mean what emotion does it invoke in the people who read it and share it? And first of all, it reflects this cultural identity of blue-collar whiteness. Second of all, it gives a sense of urgency that this is something important that you need to act upon, that something bad is going to happen that you need to stop. The third is that it not only creates in-group solidarity, but it tends to reinforce out-group animus as well, and that it expresses resentment towards the undeserving. Now, this idea of a deep story comes from Arlie Hostchild's book, um, Stranger in Their Own Land, which is an ethnography of conser mainstream conservatives in Louisiana. And she talks about how they share this sort of deep story or this sort of base level meta narrative that underlies their political beliefs. And a lot of that we've also seen in our qualitative analysis of problematic information, fake news stories, and far right extremist information. It often reflects these same values and effective appeals. So what happens rather than looking at cable news or talk radio when we look at social media? So first, social media is extremely, obviously information is extremely easy to create and disseminate. This means that all political orientations can now create and disseminate their own information. So this comes from an anarcho-feminist blog. So anarchists who identify as feminists and are also animal friendly, queer positive, and anti-fascist. Um, but you can also, you know, regardless of what your per particular political proclivities are, uh, you can read a blog or watch a pod, listen to a podcast or a YouTube video about it. So I have read, uh, there's a group, neo-reactionaries who think we should return to feudal monarchism with the feudal states being startups. Um, there's a group of, pro, no, I'm serious. There's a group of pro-Stalin fans on Reddit that have their own subreddit that are really into that. Um, there's all kinds of right-wing, left-wing, anything you can think of. So what this does is it has the effect of what political scientists called opening the Overton window. And the Overton window is the range of ideas that are typically acceptable in mainstream American political discourse, which in the US is usually center left to center right. Um, we don't tend to have a lot of extremist opinions on the left because the U US kind of got rid of all of its like socialist and communist mainstream news sources after the Red Scare in the 60s. Whereas you do have socialist newspapers in a lot of like Northern European countries, for example, we don't really have those in the US. And finally, there's no editorial gatekeeping on social media, obviously. So we, we have this sort of opening up and this ability of people to create media without any kind of editorial oversight. But I think that what's most important is the role of social sharing. Um, so news is only, one, is only one of many information types that ends up in your news feed, whether that's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram stories, whatever. Um, Alfred Hermita calls this ambient journalism, that you can go onto Facebook and you're not necessarily looking to consume news, but you will consume news because that's part of your news feed. Now, studies are showing that you are more likely to trust a story if it's shared by someone you trust, regardless of the accuracy of the information or the original source. And I, I, I left the, uh, the, the references off this deck, but it's a, um, a study by Mary Madden uh, out of Data and Society and then a big study by the Knight Foundation. Um, the Madden study is mostly on teenagers. The Knight Foundation study is bigger, but they both found that when people are assessing the credibility of something on social media, they assess the credibility by the credibility of the person who shared it. So if you're, you know, if you're wacky uncle sh that you don't really trust shares a story, even if it's from a mainstream news source, you're less likely to trust it than you are if it's, tr if it's shared by somebody whose opinions you really do trust, even if they're, tr they're sharing something from a less reputable source. And finally, that there's comments and editorializing on every item. So it's rare to see a social item shared online without somebody putting their two cents in about it. As you can see, this is a quick clip of um, one of my Twitter feeds. People are, there's, there's a, a variety of different information and there's commentary on each inf piece of information that's shared. So somebody saying this is a great piece on the, the uh, blockchain and Bitcoin. So this... The third change is algorithmic visibility. And 
right now, the automated sources that we have that make content more visible are very, very bad at distinguishing between reputable information and poor information. So these are screenshots from um, Google and Twitter from the Vega shooting. And on the right, you have a search for Gary Danley, who is the shooter's brother. And 4chan poll came up with this idea that Gary Danley was a member of Antifa and had filled his hotel room with Antifa literature, and they were trying to link him and the shooter together. Um, and if you search for Gary Danley's name the day after the shooting, out of your top three results, two of them were from 4chan, which is not a news source, let alone a reputable news source, let alone anything, let alone anything that Google should be recommending. Um, and, and then on the left, you have a tweet from Kevin Roos showing how Facebook's trending topic page for the Vegas shooting was featuring two different posts from a Russian propaganda outlet. Now, anything that gets attention is able to be bubbled up by algorithms, but the problem is that the content that people are drawn to online tends to be the sort of sensational content that doesn't necessarily inform people. Um, and as long as there are algorithms that are going to increase visibility, they're going to be gamed by back bad actors. So Google put out this, you know, this little thing, like, unfortunately, early this morning, we briefly serviced an accurate 4chan website. We're sorry, we'll do better in the future. This is very, very similar to the statement they put out after the uh, David Hogg crisis actors thing just happened in Parkland. So why do people share fake news? Um, first of all, we need to understand that they're sharing stories on social media where there's a great deal of value signaling, that you're trying to demonstrate your own identity, you're performing your identity, and you're also identifying with a certain group and you're performing that you are a member of that group. You're defining yourself and the people you affiliate with against outsiders. Um, which is what contributes to polarization, is not just this in-group identity, but is this out-group animus. Um, and this social sharing is really key because we have to understand how people share stories to express themselves and broadcast their values and norms. People also share news stories that support their own belief systems, the deep story, which are also found in mainstream news coverage and politicians. So, the same deep stories that are told on Fox News and that Donald Trump is tapping into are the same deep stories that are told in problematic news from the right-wing point of view. Even if the facts of the stories aren't the same, the deep stories that they're tapping into are the same thing. Now, studies, are show, studies show that people are much more likely to believe something if it reinforces their own pre-existing beliefs. And the deep story is often counterfactual. So one example of something that would fit the conservative deep story is that conservatives come to the United States just to collect benefits and live high off the hog from the government state, which is not empirically true. Um, but it's very difficult to correct problematic information if it's congruent with partisan beliefs or if it triggers partisan feelings. Once you get that trigger of partisanship, people tend to push back against it. Um, in these cases, people often don't believe fact checkers. They often see them as a liberal conspiracy, or they become resentful when they're fact checked, or they double down on their beliefs when they're corrected. And um, Brendan Nyhan, at, at, who's a political scientist at Dartmouth, has done a great series of studies on how fact checking may cause people to double down on their incorrect beliefs rather than cause them to change their beliefs. And finally, when the mainstream media does correct a story, often the repetition of the false story reinforces the message through that repetition, um, which is, I think, the opposite effect that we would like it to have. So if we follow my socio-technical model of fake news to answer the question, why do people share fake news, we can say that partisan Americans share fake news stories that support their pre-existing beliefs and signal their identity to like-minded others. And I would expect that we would find this on the left as well, that the left would be motivated to share a different set of stories, but they would share them for the same reasons that they support their own pre-existing beliefs and signal their identity. The messages, the successful fake news stories on the right-hand side repeat deep stories that are found in mainstream conservative media, or they make effective appeals to identity. And finally, affordances. The algorithmic visibility and social sharing massively increase the scale and spread of problematic information. So even though rumors and conspiracy theories are nothing new in American politics, it's a scope and scale of these two concepts of social sharing and, and uh, algorithmic visibility that are really problematic. So what should we do? The first thing is that when we're studying fake news, we have to understand it as part of a larger media ecosystem that includes mainstream partisan news outlets and politicians. Even though it's very tempting, I think, to isolate tech 
technical platforms and say, if we can just solve the problem on Facebook, we'll solve the problem of fake news. I think we need to think about this. Like nobody just gets their social news from Facebook. People get their news from a wide variety of different places. And if all of these different types of outlets are reinforcing the same incorrect beliefs that are, even if they're not the most extremist beliefs, that's still a problem. The second is that we have to take polarization and partisanship into account when we're examining the efficacy of media literacy and fact checking, which may mean that as well as those strategies, we also have to pursue other solutions that might appeal to the more partisan members of the public. And finally, we really need to scrutinize the ways in which algorithms and ad systems promote or incentivize problematic content. So there was a recent article in The Guardian about a French study on YouTube that found that YouTube tends to send people down conspiratorial rabbit holes regardless of what you type in. So if you go to YouTube and you type in science, within if you keep clicking on the recommended videos, you'll get to flat earther videos and videos about aliens and things like that. If you go to YouTube and you're a pretty mainstream conservative and you're just looking for some like positive videos about Donald Trump, within a few clicks of the recommended video, you'll get down into these conspiracy theory videos about how Hillary Clinton is like a murderous thug. Um, and so forth and so on. I'm sure if you click on, if you search for health information, you'll also find these really like weird, sketchy videos. Now, why is that? It's because YouTube wants you to stay on YouTube. They want you to keep watching YouTube. YouTube is not necessarily competing with Facebook. They're competing with like Netflix. They're competing with Hulu. And so the autoplay feature on YouTube encourages people to just sit there and sort of binge watch YouTube, just like Netflix's autoplay feature encourages people to binge watch Netflix. So it's in, Netflix, it's in YouTube's best interest to keep serving you videos that will keep you on the site. And the videos that often get a lot of engagement are ones that are really sensational or really outrageous. And that's why um, I think that the recommendation algorithms also need to be looked at to see the type of information that they're, um, that they're regularly serving to people, whether or not um, that is accurate information. And finally, we need to think about the economic incentives in journalism to quickly source stories or spread rumors. There's not really a lot of economic incentives for a journalist to like sit and thoughtfully fact check a story before they make sure that it's true. There's a lot of incentives for them to pump out a certain amount of stories per day and to try to break news before anyone else, um, which again ties into the fact that this is an ecosystem and not just um, a set of social media technologies. So thank you. If you're interested in reading more about the work that my team is doing, um, you can download all of our reports from datasociety.net. And I'd also like to thank um, one of my postdocs, Francesca Tripodi, Reese Peck, for sharing his book in progress with me, and everyone at the Data and Society and Media Manipulation team. Thank you. hiding out in the back of the room there. Uh, so we have uh, Carlos Sevilla with us. He's an associate professor of technical communication. Uh, and he's going to provide um, uh, a way for us to start the conversation with some, with some thoughts and maybe some questions. So Carlos, feel free to stand there or grab a seat, yeah, whatever yeah. you'd like to do. All right. Well, we had a meeting last Friday, and we tried to establish what was the pattern that the discussions were going to follow. And Tano came with a sophisticated idea, and I said, well, let's just make jokes about it. <laughs> when I decided that making jokes about it was not the best thing. So I actually took to my world of writing doodles and things on a piece of paper, because Professor Marvick was very kind to send me a more uh, elaborate version of this as a paper. Yeah. And I was like, yes, awesome. I have things that I can actually talk about. Um, the way that I see it, this is going to sound like I'm mansplaining some of the concepts. That is not really the intention. But in one of the tropes, one of the, the, the moves that we were discussing on Friday is, I think Professor Luther was the one who said, just take something that you could see as an implication or application to the work that we do. So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm going to try to take two of the major implications that I see from, from the presentation. And as any good and decent academic work, those implications have two phases. One is the implications for research and then implications for practice. And I'm going to go first with research and then with, with practice. Uh, as uh, Professor Marwick says, the concept of fake news is kind of weird. So she prefers to use problematic information. And for people studying communication and rhetoric, uh, I think problematic information is at the same time reinforcing and challenging models 
of communication that we have had for many years, including the hypodermic needle, the, the magic bullet. Uh, and that also affects the ways in which we see interpretation and hermeneutics of texts. And here text is not just a piece of writing, but also videos and whatever now we can see on the web or whatever you can see on an app on your phone or any other device that you have. Uh, it is really challenging the concepts of inter intertextuality and hypertextuality that go way back to the work of people like Julia Kristeva and Susan Sontag um, taking interpretation in many different ways. And I think that every time that you talk about uh, hermeneutics and interpretation, there's a, a rule that you have to scribble annoying terms in Latin on, on, on a whiteboard. <laughs> so there's the author's intentions, and that's the reader's intentions. That is what keeps those readers from being those dupes mm -hmm. that you're criticizing. There's no way that we can just assume that I'm going to send you a message, and then you're going to get it. So the reader, the user, has her intentions. So if you just think in the old school model that I'm going to send you something that has my intentions, and you're going to receive it blindly and say, oh, I believe this. I, I'm, I have no agency, no power to question this. But that's not true. Because as you said, these are not dupes, and they have their own agenda, their own intentions. But Umberto Eco, a couple of uh, decades ago, came up with the hypothetical idea of having another set of intentions, the intentions of the actual work. The work had its own intentions that mediated and changed and also combined the intentions of the author and the reader or the user. And that is not that Echo was saying, one day we're going to have Facebook feeds. He was talking more about books and saying, uh, maybe the reader is going to develop her own pattern of reading uh, Moby Dick. And instead of going, starting from Call Me Ishmael, she's going to go in another uh, direction. But there are some books and canonical texts like Julio Cortázar's uh, Rayuela. Hopscotch, that's the name in English. Uh, comes with different paths. It's like choose your own adventure. So the book itself is telling you go in another direction. So there's these different levels of intentionality. And uh, now we have Wikipedia. And in Wikipedia, if you're reading something, you can click on a link and then you go and go and go in YouTube. You click on a link and then you go and go and go. And in Facebook feeds, you click on a link and then you end up going there. And as you said, that is the work's intention. We want you to stay here as much as you can because we're making money by you watching or clicking on the ads. So that really reinforces and also challenges the models. Now, in the most attractive and interesting part, we move to the practice. And the practice implications have another two dimensions. I don't know why I like to split things in categories. <laughs> practice for citizens. Because it's obvious that as a citizen, you're going to be involved in something that affects your practice in a democracy or whatever political system that you're living in. And for that, I don't have a solution. You don't have a solution. We don't have solutions. And that is the big problem, that this kind of, and I want to avoid having the, the two very rigid spectrum, I mean, rules of conservatives and liberals, whereas it's more like a spectrum. But we're talking about fringe people, like mm -hmm. you mentioned. This is the fringe in which you are. And that's making for the average citizen, regardless of what camp you side with primarily, it makes it very hard to cross the barriers and foster and engage in dialogue across that spectrum. And for practitioners in the citizen world, that is very difficult. And we don't have a clear solution. Now, for practitioners, in actual media, people who work in media, social media people, something to consider is for content strategists, for content developers, and for algorithm developers, creators of algorithms, who are human beings, the algorithms will filter things and will show you 4chan, or will show you these conspiracy videos when you go to YouTube, but those are created by human beings. And in many cases, Facebook has content strategists, human beings who actually curate information, not just depending on, on, on the algorithms. For those, you have to think about your own agency and your own intentions and how that is affecting what the users will see when they go to the medium or the channel. And for media professionals, like the mainstream media professionals, you are amplifying and you're taking out of the context in which this fake news or problematic information are developed, 
And you mentioned in the paper the two-step model of communication, the Katz and Lazarus felt that I have a message, and my message is not going to be as good as those opinion leaders who will take it and rebroadcast it. So that's the problem, too. Because if in the context of I love my fake news from this side of the spectrum, I'm going to be consuming this, and they're going to be retweeted and resent by people who think like me, I'm okay. But if I put something in 4chan and then CNN or a local branch of Fox News in D.C. watches and amplifies that, then that media venue is doing that two-step two step role yeah. and then bringing it out of the context that you say is so important mm -hmm. to see those fake news or problematic information in the context of this is where it's being produced, this is where it's being consumed. And those are the intentions because they don't have the intention of being persuasive. They don't want to convince you. And that's why giving them Snopes or giving them uh, media literacy courses, that's not going to change their, their, their intention because that's not what they want. They don't want to convince you that you should go to the side. They want to reinforce the status of whatever that's, that's happening on their side, fringe side of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. So that's my mansplaining of the situation. Can I, can I Which, back? Yes, go yeah, ahead. I, I beg yeah, you. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you so much. Uh, do you want to sit? Um, sure, why not? <laughs> it's like a TV show. Yeah, yeah. no, it's like the Letterman, it's like the, you know, uh, the, the talk like show. My next yeah. guest needs no introduction. <laughs> So, okay, so three things. First of all, the term problematic information, I have really mulled over. I am aware that it sounds a little bit like Orwellian doublespeak to harken back to one of our previous uh, talks today. Um, so this piece up here, the blue, the lexicon of lies, in terms of problematic information, is a, um, one of our postdocs, Caroline Jack, wrote that, and she's a historian of propaganda. So she went through like all the propaganda persuasion literature and looked at all the different terms that people use to talk about different types of information. And she used this term, Pro problematic information to kind of encompass all of them. Um, because one of the problems is that when you're looking at information online, it's often classified in old school like taxonomies, it's often classified by intention. Mm -hmm. So the actor's intention, right? So if you are if you're a newspaper and you print something incorrectly, but then you issue a retraction, that's misinformation because it's not intended. But if you're a, you know, a political propagandist and you're spreading lies about the, all, the candidate you don't like, that's considered disinformation. Um, but the problem is that online it's like almost impossible to determine the intent of a piece of content. Like that Fox News meme thing, like I can, like I can say I, what I think the intent is, but I don't know who created it. I don't know what communities it circulated in. I don't know how many times it's been modified or altered. I don't know if it, it could be shared by somebody who's super like pro-Jewish to be like, yay, look at us, like with all these great jobs we have. It could be shared by, a, like there's so many different reasons why it could be shared or spread. And so trying to determine intent is so hard. Um, so we're trying to stay away from the intent-based networks. Um, I don't think problematic information is a great term because what you consider problematic is gonna be based on your positionality, which is gonna be wildly variable. Um, but I really, and, and that's why I use fake news in my title of my talk. Um, but I don't think fake news is any good either. So I really don't know. Yeah. I would love to hear other people's Maybe the ideas. creators know that it's going to be problematic, and that's part of the intention. I'm creating this because I know that it's going to be problematic for some people. Yeah, and I mean, things are going to spread more if they're ambivalent. Like, people can read their own interpretations into things. They're going to be spread by different communities. And there was an article like yesterday or the day before that was making the claim that one of the reasons that the David Hogg crisis actor uh, theories spread so quickly is because tons of people were spreading them being like, isn't this a bunch of garbage? Like, this is a lie. This is terrible that people are treating this kid this way, right? So even people who may disagree with the conspiracy theory are still spreading it. Good point. I had another point, but I <laughs> don't remember what it was. Um, what was your point? You, you were talking about something about leaders, creators, practitioners, practitioners, people who are actually working in media working or in media. social media. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Let, let's tell yeah. jokes. <laughs> I would love to hear if anyone has a few pushbacks or if everyone's just like, when is lunch? <laughs> <laughs> is just educating. 
educating mainstream journalists on how to cover some of these like hoaxes and pranks and conspiracies theories because they keep falling for the same thing over and over again. Um, and we have a study that isn't out yet where one of our another faculty affiliate, so another faculty like me who's with a different institution, interviewed like 50 journalists about how they felt about covering the 2016 election. And that piece I think is putting together like some sets of recommendations for journalists. Because the problem is that some dumb hoax will come out, like the idea that Cruz, the Parkland shooter, was a white supremacist, and then someone like the Associated Press will retweet it, or they'll confirm it, right? And that's a, that was a lie that was spread specifically by white supremacist groups to try to discredit the mainstream media by showing that the mainstream media spreads false information and therefore calling their credibility into question. And they fall for that kind of thing again and again and again. And this pattern where this stuff starts out of these fringe groups and then ends up on mainstream media, like we've just seen it hundreds of times in the last year. So I think that there's a really good way to intervene in very mainstream journalists because I think in general those are people who are committed to the idea of truth in the same way that researchers are committed to the idea of truth. Most of the journalists working in those organizations are educated with a traditional journalistic education that you know prioritizes objectivity and fact checking and all those types of things. And you know they also are accountable to their readers and their readers of like one of their the partisan, that's the third thing I was gonna say, I wanted to talk about the partisanship issue, is that the, the split is not between, the, the, the partisan split is in media consumption, which is like a real problem, because mainstream media is alienating like millions of people with conservative points of view right now, and again, they just keep doing it and doing it and doing it. So that would maybe be playing to a more liberal audience, but I still think that that would be a good first step that is possible. Um, We've been working, like DNS has been working on that a little bit, but it's really hard because there's a lot of things that the mainstream media is really married to, like showing both sides of an issue. In some cases, that creates a false equivalency where something that's really not a big deal is put on the same level as like a really big deal. Um, and, and that's a very hard thing, because that's like 50 years of training, so. And, and that is not new, because no. the mainstream media doesn't know and hasn't done anything new with anything that goes viral online, and I remember in the early 2000s when videos started showing up online of a kid falling. Yeah. You will see that two days, three days in Ellen DeGeneres will show it in her show. Yeah. And then it will be in, in CNN and they don't know how to treat something that was born in social yeah. media or on the yeah. internet. And they say, oh, it's news, can yeah. we broadcast it? And then they add their own flavor to it and it, it reaches a new audience. So I have a question and maybe you can take this up uh, mm -hmm. in la for lunch as well. Um, so you mentioned that media literacy and fact checking don't really work. Uh, so I'm just curious in your ethnography study or in your research in general, what are some of the examples which tells you that why these don't work? So there was a recent example where Google decided they were going to include the credibility of a news source when people were searching for news stories on Google. And so what they did was they created this like little kind of box next to every news source that would say things like, you know, the Washington Post has won this many Pulitzer Prizes and it's, you know, considered really credible and the game we pundit is not considered credible and it's a garbage fire. Well, they probably said it nicer than that, but um, <laughs> they, so the Daily Caller, which is another hyperpartisan news outlet, went through and they did a pretty systematic analysis and they came up with a list of like every organization that was considered trustworthy and every organization that was considered untrustworthy and all of the organizations that were considered untrustworthy were the conservative press. And so they put out this huge press release that's like Google is biased against conservatives. And that's a very easy case to make. Like very easy. Like you look at this and you're like, oh, the liberal outlets are seen as credible and the conservative outlets aren't. And so they took it down after a week. Um, so that's a good example, I think, of how that kind of fact checking can really backfire in partisan environments. With the media literacy, the really interesting thing is that there aren't a lot of media literacy programs that have measured efficacy. So we had a convening last year of a bunch of like media literacy experts, and a lot of them are just like, educators like trying out stuff in their classrooms. Like we need larger scale programs where we can really kind of test how they work. Um, and the studies are not great so far. Like even after going through media literacy programs, people still aren't good at assessing information credibility online. And it also varies with like demographics. Yes, so the user is exactly. Like there was one great study where they had three groups of people, um, like high school kids, Stanford history, one. what? This, it's a Stanford study, right? Yeah, with like the PhD students and yeah. the professional fact the checkers. Yeah, the, prof the historian PhD students and the professional fact checkers. And the, profes the PhD history, history PhD students did horrible. They did like about as good as the high school kids. Mm -hmm. The fact checkers did really well because the fact checkers looked for outside assessment signals while the, those 
high school kids and the PhD students just went to the site and tried to assess signals on the site. And sites now are really good at creating signals that are false, mm -hmm. you know, that are falsity. Can I just change it? Oh, I, I just want to say that I'm not sure that you can go from Google's credibility box not working to that approach doesn't work because maybe the design was just not the right thing. Maybe Google's not the right player. Maybe yeah, I can um, give you I can give you a dozen know, other examples. But the thing like is Snopes that, doesn't work. Politifact doesn't mm -hmm. work. Well, and, and what do we mean by work? I mean, you know, if you I mean, if you refute something to somebody who's who does this fake news no, or for just a has hobby a strong or something. partisan belief. Yes. I mean, refuting that and presenting evidence that it's actual factual. Be like, okay, whatever, and tomorrow they'll make another new one because they're calling working for the same thing. That's not real. I mean, that may that is maybe, but what I'm concerned about is the evidence that when you, if, if someone is has a partisan attachment to a particular political belief, and there someone comes to them and says this is a false news story, they end up saying that the fact checking mechanism is a, is a liberal bias. So like Snopes. Fact, all of those are seen as yeah. 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 But we, I think we have to ask whether anybody ever changes their mind and, and like, what is our criteria for success? Mm -hmm. yeah. And then that, I think those are a break series. Yeah, Harper's had a section on persuasion, yeah. I think, last month, and whatever happened to persuasion and being able to yeah. convince. Yeah. 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 I, think, I, think, I think those are really good areas for future research. Mm -hmm. Lunch? All right, yeah. Yay. Yay. <laughs> That's all.